Who's the king of rock and roll? All right, good. Some more agreement there. We got Elvis. Ain't nothing like a hound dog or but a hound dog or whatever how it goes. All right, how about reggae music? Yeah, and you all know because it's the only reggae person you ever listened to before, right? You know, I could rattle off 20 more people that we could debate on back and forth, like is this person the greatest of all time or is this person the greatest of all time? But there's one thing that they all have in common is that all of those all-time great artists and bands have put album after album after album out year after year, maybe some of them too many years, um, but they've put out lots of albums, which is the opposite of a one-hit wonder. You know, a one-hit wonder, the band just is popular for one moment in time, but these albums, one of the things that they reflect is the journey of these artists and these bands you know, their debut album when they come out, or maybe they hit a low point and, they, and they, their, their writing is more raw and real, or maybe they have a spiritual awakening and they start talking about God. Elvis wrote about, he's a gospel Elvis out there, and uh, he wrote gospel songs. And, or maybe it's a, there's a cause, like, hey, I'm gonna stand for love or justice or peace. And, and some of those great artists kind of have a journey. Um, and a journey that follows and reflects their life, the ups and downs of their life. And the reason why I'm talking about that is because the book of the Bible that we've been going through uh, in this series, One Hit Wonders, is a book called Psalms, and it's a book of songs. And in this book, we have all types of songs from highs and lows in our life. And the reality is it's written by real people who went through real circumstances that were high and low. And it's helpful for us because we can really engage and connect with these songs. Um, There's different types of songs. We started with a certain type of psalm called a psalm of lament. So in Psalm 40 was week one of One Hit Wonders. And a psalm of lament is like when somebody's crying out to God, almost complaining to God and asking God to help them And this is the most popular um, genre of songs in the book of Psalms. It's one third of the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. But there's also in the other, and they swing the pendulum from you know, being depressed and, and sad to you know, great experiences of praising God and praising God for who he is and his character. There's other Psalms that are about Psalms of praise and there's Psalms of thanksgiving where we thank God for specific things that he's done in his life. And then there's another uh, type of Psalms called Psalms of enthronement that are written and that picture God of this royal majesty and they really point to Jesus Christ. Um, the coming king, that Jesus was going to be the coming king who would reign, and, and a lot of those psalms point to Jesus, but the psalm and the type of psalm that we're going to study this morning is called a psalm of confession, uh, and a psalm of confession, these aren't lottery numbers this morning, these are uh, different psalms of confession, so if you have a Bible and you open the Bible to the very middle, so just go like halfway, you're going to find yourself in the book of Psalms, and if you want to see the psalm that we're going to be in this morning, it's going to be Psalm 51. We're actually going to talk about two psalms because they mirror each other a little bit, and that's 51 and 32. And as we launch into this psalm of confession, I want to give you a definition of what a psalm of confession is. And it's simply an acknowledgement of sin invites the blessing of God. And so when you think of all those different psalms uh, that are psalms of confession, uh, you read that right. Uh, An acknowledgement of sin, talking about sin, actually invites blessing from God. And when we don't talk about sin, it hinders the blessing of God in our life. And now I know that sin is a word that is really taboo in our culture. We don't like to talk about it. In fact, just recently, the Junior Oxford Dictionary removed the word sin from the dictionary. I mean, imagine what it takes to remove a word from a dictionary. And yet they just did that recently where uh, they explained that they no longer thought that it had relevance to younger generations um, and that it was a word that fell out of disuse. Um, I mean, just think about the seriousness of removing a word. And I think we remove the word sin probably because it's an ugly word. And the reality is it is an ugly word because there's something ugly about sin. And even though sin's been removed from the Junior Oxford Dictionary, it doesn't mean it's been removed from the world. It hasn't been removed from our experience. And we, we need to talk about it. And it's in the Bible, and we want to talk about it. We don't want to shy away from it. We don't want to beat ourselves up with the word. Um, but we don't want to downplay it either. And I think we can downplay the word sin by using other words, like mistake. You know, like, I made a mistake. Uh, but God isn't angry with a fifth-grade boy who made a mistake on a math test. 
Um, and so mistake isn't, you know, the full picture of what sin is or disease. Sometimes we can call sin a disease. It's something that we can't avoid or happened to us. You know, it just, I kind of have a short fuse. You know, it's just how I'm wired and, uh, you know, or I have this ongoing struggle that I have no control over. It just happens to me. And a disease doesn't get at the full picture of this word sin either or shortcoming. Maybe we could say, hey, I, just, I, I didn't measure up. Uh, last week, Croatia didn't measure up in the World Cup when they lost to France, but I don't think anybody's saying they sinned against God. And so we need to talk about this word sin. Uh, we can't remove it from our vocabulary because I think if we do, then we remove the blessing of God from our life. There's no forgiveness if we don't confess sin. There's no healing if we don't acknowledge sin. And there's no blessing when we don't talk about this word. And I'm pretty sure this morning that you want some healing, a type of healing in your life. You probably want forgiveness. You probably want the blessing of God. And we're gonna look at Psalm 51 and one of the most popular characters that we see in this story of God in the Bible called King David. And he talks about sin. In fact, in Psalm 51, before we even get into the actual song, there's a heading in this song. Not all of the Psalms have a heading, but this one does and it says this. For the director of music, meaning this song is being given to the director of music, it's a psalm of David, meaning it's a song that David wrote. And it says, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So we have the exact circumstances in the context of what's happening, why this song is written, which we don't have that. I would love to know why a lot of the songs in our culture are written. I would love to know what they were thinking or what they experienced. And here in this song, we actually do. And if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this story, you can find it in another book of the Bible called 2 Samuel. It's in chapter 11 and 12. And King David is a highly respected, uh, revered, honored king. Um, but Psalm, uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is really his worst moment in his life. And it's told for, for generation after generation to hear about. And there's a reason why, because there's a lesson here. King David is a little bit older in his reign here of Israel, so many years had passed. Um, he had aged a little bit. Maybe you know his good look, looks weren't with him anymore, and his entrepreneurial, aggressive spirit had had gone. I think he maybe picked up a little Rogaine and was caught at bingo nights a couple times. Uh, but either way, this particular spring comes in Second Samuel 11, and what happens in the spring is that a king leads there. Um, their soldiers out into war. Except this spring, David decided to stay back and decided not to go to war. And we don't know why he didn't go to war that year, but maybe he was bored or restless thinking, you know, I've already done this before. There's gotta be something else that's bigger or better for me. Uh, I don't know if he feels like he just needs a break or a breather. Hey guys, I'm gonna sit this one out this year. Or maybe he just drifted to a place of not wanting to be involved or connected. Like, I'm just a little disconnected and I don't really feel like being with the guys. Whatever the reason, David wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And I wonder this morning if you're in a similar place, that you're not doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. The way God's wired you, the things he's called you to do in life, and you're not only doing that, but you're not following after God or connected to him. Uh, maybe you're doing things you know you're not supposed to be doing. And we, you can relate to David here. You're just a little bored maybe in your relationship with God. You know, in an ever-changing world, we did these one-hit wonders of culture. You know, there's, there's always something that's bigger and better or cooler out there. We chase after these other things rather than the same God who loves the same way, forgives the same way, day after day, year after year for us. Maybe we were just restless thinking there's something better for us or the motivation to follow God or serve him is just low for us this morning. And you have a choice just like David. You have a choice to stay connected to God and do what he's called you to do, or you have a choice to disconnect, to stay back, to not be involved, to not pursue God. And in this part of David's life, he chooses to hang back. And it has devastating effects in his life when he lives outside of the boundaries that God has given him. You know, and this is typical maybe for an aging guy can't quite sleep through the night, so he's a little restless. He gets up, goes for a walk, and on this particular night, he sees a woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba, and he calls his servant to him, and he says, hey, can you go tell Bathsheba to come hang out? Um, the servant 
is astute and wise and he knows what David's up to. Uh, he knows that David doesn't just want to hang out with Bathsheba. And he goes, oh, you mean the wife of Uriah the Hittite? You know your buddy Uriah, his wife? And it's kind of like a warning alarm for David, like, hey, you shouldn't be having her over. And so the servant is saying, David, I know what you're up to. I had a friend like that growing up. His name was Eric. We called him conscience because anytime we wanted to do something that was probably stupid or we shouldn't be doing, he'd be like, guys, I don't think we should be doing this. Are you sure this is a good idea? He's like, we don't really care, Eric. We're gonna do it anyway. And he would drive us nuts. But he was like that, that warning bell or alarm for us in the same way this servant of David is saying like, hey, you mean the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And he's blowing through this alarm. And we get these alarms a lot in our life. Shouldn't be dating this guy or girl. It's not a good guy. Shouldn't be making this lame excuse to skip out on a good opportunity. You shouldn't be spending your money in this way. And whether it's a person that is that like warning alarm for us or just our own conscience, when we ignore these warnings, whatever form they come in, what happens is it sets destructive forces in motion. And that's what happens with David's life. The, the destructive forces are set in motion when he, Bathsheba does come over and he commits adultery with her, he gets her pregnant, and has all the makings of a Jerry Springer, Montel Williams show to start with, but then it gets serious as he tries to cover it up. And it becomes a 60 Minutes show material there because he kills Uriah and other guys in an attempt to cover up his sin. And it's a downward spiral because as he tries to cover up one sin after the next sin, he sins on and on, he's just making this huge mess. And he went from, in a moment, being a respected, godly king to being a lying, cheating, stealing, adulterer, and murderer. You know, it's safe to say things went way worse than he had planned with just that one decision to stay back when he should have gone out to war. With just another decision to have that lady over when he shouldn't have done that. And he lived outside the boundaries that God had given him, and that's sin. And that's what sin does to our life, and David's life is an example for that, but, but what we're checking out is, what does he write as a result of this experience? Because Psalm 32 mirrors Psalm 51 as well. Psalm 51 is a year after that, but David also writes in Psalm 32 about what he experienced as he went a full year still hiding and concealing this sin from everybody. Nobody was on to him yet. And he describes it this way in Psalm 32, verse three and four. For when I kept silent, meaning as I continued to hide my sin, as I continued to hide all of these things that I had done, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. He's talking about like the hand of God, which is conviction being heavy on him. He talks about the strength being dried up by the heat of summer. Maybe some of you can relate to such an experience where you're hiding things in your life, you're not dealing with stuff that you should be dealing with, you're, you just know you're, you're not on the right path and you don't want to tell anybody else about it, you're ashamed about it and you just feel this way physically. See, when we don't deal with sin, when we don't confess it more specifically, there are symptoms that come in our lives, all of our lives. The first symptom is a physical symptom. That's what David's writing about. He's writing, I am physically weak. I am experiencing anxiety, stress, and the heavy hand of God on me. And these symptoms are, are common among us too. There's actually a psychology textbook called Coping with Stress. And it talks about people who keep secrets. And it describes their symptoms very similarly to David. Um, as patients come in and talk to their psychiatrist and talk about anxiety and depression, physical pain, headaches, and so on and so forth. One psychiatrist in this book is even quoted as saying, if I can convince my patients that they're truly forgiven, 75% of them would never come see me again. This is why Jesus came. So 75% of his patients could be forgiven, could confess, could be healed, could walk in the newness of life that Jesus offers to them and he wouldn't have to see 75% of them because forgiveness is offered to people that confess their sin. But when we don't, we have these physical and emotional 
symptoms. We also have relational symptoms. You know, how we connect and relate to our friends and family members. And I just want to ask you a couple questions that help you see if there's any relational symptoms that you could relate to now or maybe in the past. Where do you have, ever, have you ever had um, an underlying sense of frustration with people? Just like you're just easily frustrated. And often that's like, it's just like maybe some guilt spilling over um, into the lives of other people as they rub you the wrong way or whatever it is. Have you ever avoided certain people? Just their presence is like, you just know you're not right. You just know if you're around them, they might call you out. And if they just knew something about you, like, so you avoid them so that you don't have to be confronted with the issue that you have with God. Have you ever been defensive? You know, or just paranoid. You know, you're hiding something, you're paranoid, you want to be found out, and somebody says something completely un- disconnected uh, from what you're hiding and you're just paranoid like what did you mean by that everything that people say somebody's out to get you or they're going to find you out at some point and you just find yourself often defensive or maybe you're really critical of other people see when people are forgiven by Jesus Christ and understand the complete forgiveness that he offers to them they're pretty gracious towards other people they're not critical people they're some of the most kind um, they judge the best and they think the best about other people uh, and gracious people that are around. If you find yourself being really highly critical of somebody else or other people, are, are these relational symptoms of not dealing with the sin in our life? And the most important symptom is a spiritual symptom. You know, like our sin separates us from God. And if you've never confessed sin to God before, then you're not connected to him. Um, it's the first step. Augustine said the first good work is the confessing of evil works. And to confess those things in your life to God is the first good work that you can do in your life to experience a relationship with him. And maybe you have confessed sin to God, but you're, you're still hiding things out. And what, when you're hiding out and you're not confessing sin to him that's existing in your life, you're weakening your relationship with him. You're weakening your connection with him. And this is not the life that God has for you. It's not the life God wanted for David. And David's going through all of these symptoms, physical, relational, and spiritual, until Nathan shows up. And Nathan shows up a year later. And he's the kind of guy that if you're going to hide from sin, you're hiding from him. Um, But he came and he sought David out because it says this. It says the Lord sent Nathan to David, meaning like God told Nathan, like, hey, you got to go talk to David. And Nathan was going to David with a mission to call him out. And it says this in the story, when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town. There's one guy who was rich and the other guy was poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man, he just had one little ewe lamb that he had bought. Uh, He raised it and he grew up with it and his children. It says he shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. This this little ewe lamb was like a daughter to him. And Nathan goes on to tell David, now there a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own. And, and so he says to the traveler, instead, why don't you take the ewe lamb that belongs to the poor man? So instead of the rich man who had all of these sheep, just choose one, just take the one loved ewe lamb from the poor guy. And we all see the injustice of this story and David's hearing it like it's a real story, like this actually happened. And so it says he burns with anger against the man and he says to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And you might be seeing where this is going or might even know the story. And David is angry and and Nathan does one of the bravest things that we see in the Bible because his whole purpose to going to King David is to confront him and call him out. And the reality is he's going and talking to one of the most powerful people that ever existed and he could just say, you're fired and he would not have a job tomorrow. He could even say, you're gonna be killed and you would be dead tomorrow. And remember, he's gone a year hiding the fact that he's murdered somebody, that he's committed adultery. And Nathan is speaking up and confronting this king, David. And he says to him in this moment, you know what? 
David, you are the man. You're the man. You're the rich guy who had a ton of sheep. Uriah, he's the poor guy who had one you little lamb. You took it and you killed him. And he goes on to say this. This is what the Lord, the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul, meaning I saved your life. I made you king. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. David, if, if this wasn't enough for you, like I would have been glad to give you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what's evil in his eyes? And Nathan does not water down what David did here. He doesn't say, hey, don't worry. Like, you're not as bad as the other kings and the other nations. He doesn't say, hey, you know, God's just going to overlook this. I'm sure it's just a bad day, a bad couple of days for you. you know, he says, God gave you so much. And maybe God's saying to you this morning, I've given you so much. I've given you so much. But it still wasn't enough. You needed more. And you turn your back on God, you lied, you stole, and you killed. And now you're hiding it. And the point of this whole interaction is Nathan didn't come to beat King David up that morning like the punching bag, I'm just going to knock him down a couple pegs. The whole reason why Nathan came is the whole reason this church exists is to help people connect to God. Nathan wanted to see his friend David and his king and his leader to be connected to God, to be in a right relationship with God, to follow God rightly again, and to stop the downward spiral that he was a part of. Do you have a Nathan in your life? A Nathan that would be willing to speak up and say something if they saw you doing something wrong? That if you were acting like a spoiled brat, they'd just tell you you're acting like a spoiled brat. If you're complaining, they would say you have so much, you don't have much to complain about that guy is bad news, they would say you shouldn't be with him, or you're really gifted and wise, you really need to be serving other people and using your gifts. Stop sitting around doing nothing. Do you have a Nathan that's willing to tell you some of those things? See, if you're running from that kind of person, it's probably an indicator that you're running from God too. That you're hiding something. So how does David respond to all of this? That's the big question for us this morning. And that's where this psalm, the one hit wonder, the Psalm 51 comes in this morning. This is the context of everything that's happening and David writes this as a response to this interaction and it gives us an indication of how he responds where he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. David is pleading for mercy from God in this psalm. He's, he's saying that, God, you're, you're loving, you're compassionate. Please have, be merciful to me. I have not been loving or compassionate, and please blot out my transgressions. He goes on to say, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sins always before me, and he has this sense of being dirty and being filthy before God, but longing to be cleansed. And so we, we see a clear indication his heart is softening that Nathan spoke into his life and redirected him back to God. And David is responding in a great way where he's saying, God, please have mercy on me, wash me, cleanse me. And then he goes on to say, against you and only you have I sinned and I've done what is evil only in your sight. And what's interesting about that statement is David sinned against a lot of people, right? And he just says, against you, God, have I sinned. Because he realizes that all sin against people or just personal and private sin is ultimately an offense to a loving, good God who we've lived outside of the boundaries that he set for us in this life. And David is acknowledging God against you and you only have I sinned. And his confession is to God. So if you're wondering, what do, what do I do with this confession thing? Who do I confess to? We're learning that and seeing that here. It's to God. And he's owning this too. He's not deflecting or making excuses He's owning this and going to God very honestly and bluntly. And if you've ever wondered what does it look like to confess sin, maybe you've heard that word before and you have other thoughts that may be more religious coming to mind, like it just gets this raw and real. You before God anywhere, anytime, being able to say these types of things. God against you, I've, I've just, I've wandered, I've walked away from you, I haven't cared about you, I haven't loved you right, I just, I haven't done right. 
This is our example of confession. So how often do we need to do this? Do we need to do it with other people? You know, do we do it once and we're good to go? What are the steps to this whole confession thing? And we see it in Psalm 51. The first step we already talked about is admit your sin. So I just want to give you some clear steps that you can take based from this song of dealing with sin and, and confessing it. And the first is to admit it. To admit it very specifically. Like, it's not helpful if you say, man, I really screwed up today. Well, a screw up by failing an exam or getting arrested for drugs is a big difference in screw ups. So be specific with God. How did you screw up? Don't minimize what you did. David's not minimizing what he's did, doing. He's saying, you know what, God, you know, if you didn't make Bathsheba bathe there, then I wouldn't have done that thing. No, he's not making an excuse for himself. He's not saying like, maybe I shouldn't have done that thing. He's like saying, no, I did this. It was wrong. And he's saying what it is specifically. He's not comparing himself to other people on some imaginary sin scale, like at least I'm not that bad. He doesn't confess it part way either here. Like he's just like laying it all out, like I'm horrible. What I've done is, is a mess. And speaking of confessing part way, there's this article that's written, it's titled, I Cheated But Only a Little. And it's written in the very fascinating Journal of Personality and so- Social Psychology. I'm sure you checked that out of the library recently. And uh, it was reported from research from 4,000 people who confessed part way. Uh, that's why it's called, I Cheated But Only a Little. And it found this, they, they kind of summarized their results by saying, People found partial confessions attractive because they expected partial confessions to be more believable than not confessing. People failed, however, to anticipate the emotional costs associated with partially confessing. In fact, partial confessions made people feel worse than not confessing or fully confessing. It seems that although partial confessions seem attractive, they come at an emotional cost. In other words, they now have two things to feel guilty about. Not just the thing that they did that was wrong, but then the covering up of it as well. Your partial confessions make people feel more guilty. And confession, like David's here in Psalm 51, when it's full and complete, can be a powerful way to deal with guilt. But only if you tell the truth. And so Psalm 51, David doesn't go halfway, doesn't minimize it. He lays it all out there. He admits his sin. The second thing he does is he apologizes and asks for forgiveness. So I'm sticking with letter A's here this morning. So admit your sin, then apologize and ask forgiveness. And he does this as it goes on in Psalm 51 saying, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Some of the key words to pull out of there, I know the verses on the screen, we're working on that. It says, cleanse me, wash me, blot out all my iniquity. He's apologizing and he's asking for God's forgiveness. And when we go back to that other Psalm 32 that kind of mirrors Psalm 51, he even says this, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. One of the most basic ways of confession, just acknowledging sin to God. And then it says, I didn't cover up my iniquity. He did for a year, but then when it was found out, he, he, uh, he didn't cover it up any longer. It says, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And one of the things that's really interesting to me about this psalm that David is writing is he doesn't say, you forgave my sin. It says, you forgave the guilt of my sin, which stands out to me, because a lot of us think, yeah, God forgives sin. Isn't that why Jesus came? Maybe you grew up here in that message your whole life. But he says he forgave the guilt of my sin. Remember that entire year that went by? How David was covering that up. His, God's heavy hand was on him. His, he felt like he was wasting away. It's because he was carrying guilt with him and shame for a full year. And maybe that's you this morning. You know that God forgave you, but you still carry around the guilt and shame of the sin that you've done in your past. And here this phrase could change you spiritually. That not only are you forgiven, but the guilt of your sin is forgiven as well. Because maybe you grew up in a culture, an environment where um, it was taught to you like, hey, you're forgiven of your sin, but don't you dare forget that you're a sinner. Like, yeah, God loves you and he cares about you and he forgave you, but you better remember what you did. Maybe you have a friend or family member that deals with you that way. Like, hey, I'm gonna forgive you, but I'm never gonna forget this. And they kind of keep score and a record of wrongs. And that's not God at all. 
And this phrase from this psalm can be so freeing if we embrace it. If we're carrying the guilt and shame, we can learn we don't have to carry that guilt and shame anymore. When Jesus died on the cross, he said this phrase, it is finished, meaning not just the forgiveness of sin, but all the baggage that comes along with it is finished too and is forgiven. And though you're not completely sinless, in God's sight, you are guiltless because of Jesus Christ. And there's words that were given in both these Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, that help us understand you know, the type of forgiveness that God gives. And the, the first word is just the simple word of forgiven, like forgiven in its basic essence is to lift a heavy burden and carry it away. Meaning the burden of sin has been lifted off of you, but it's not just like hanging over top of you, like you're being reminded of it. It's actually removed as far as the east is from the west. That guilt and that sin is removed. There's another word called covered that is used in Psalm 32 when it says to remove completely from sight. And so when David uncovers his sin, God actually covers it up. So when we uncover or confess our sin to God, God's covering up, meaning he's paying for it. He no longer sees it. He no longer views us in light of that sin that we've committed in this life. The other phrase there is washed and cleansed, which is to remove filth and to bring fragrance. You know, as a parent, there comes a time uh, when in your child's life where they start to stink. And I'm not talking like dirty diaper stink. Um, I'm talking about like their body starts to stink. And now we can laugh at it, but all of us have been through that as well. So where we had to have a parent or older person come along in our life and say, hey, get a shower. Or, hey, get a stick of deodorant. You know, like whatever we need to do to remove the stink. And and so we remove that filth there, that dirt or that grime or that stink. But but we also do something, a lot of us, different forms of deodorants or sprays or whatever we put on ourselves, and we give ourselves a nice scent, right? And that's essentially washed and cleansing that Jesus offers to us. He, he died on the cross to remove our sins, but he lived a perfect life to credit his perfect life to us so that when God sees us, there's this phrase in the Bible called the aroma of Christ. There's something about us as we follow Jesus in this life that is just attractive, that it's fragrant. There's this metaphor of a smell, like you smell good. Do you smell good this morning? Have you received this forgiveness from Jesus? You know, when we're washed and cleansed, Jesus even gives us these pictures of what we're supposed to do as his followers to remind ourselves of this washing and cleansing. We're going to take communion a little bit, and it's a reminder of his death on the cross. This is a cup with a cracker and some juice, and it reminds us every Sunday, we do this every Sunday, we take communion together of God's great love and forgiveness that's offered every week to us. But baptism, and there's going to be a baptism next week. Somebody's going to get baptized, and when we immerse somebody underwater and pull them up, it's a sign and symbol of them dying with Christ and being raised to new life. And there's this this water that represents being washed of our sin and being made new in Jesus Christ. And maybe you need that this morning. Maybe you need to take that step of trusting in Jesus Christ and take the step of obedience of being baptized, immersed underwater, coming out, and it symbolizes this type of forgiveness. So obedient steps that we take in following Jesus. And if that's a step that you need to take, put that on your Connect card this morning. Say, I want to learn more about following Jesus or I want to be baptized. And we'd love to baptize you. Next week, we're going to do another one in August. So you don't have to like hurry up and and figure this baptism out thing in, in a week. But we want to invite you to take that step. And when you experience this type of forgiveness, this type of washing and cleansing, it changes your life. It changes how you view life. It changes how you view people. It changes how you view God and understand life. And the final part of David's prayer is this third part of confession. It's another A phrase, alter your behavior. When you admit your sin first, apologize and ask forgiveness from God and alter your behavior kind of is the natural next step. It's not something you start with. You don't change your behavior and hope God likes you. You don't start doing good things and God then bestows his blessings on you. You start by admitting that you've sinned against him. Then you apologize and you ask forgiveness. And when you understand and you receive that forgiveness, your behavior changes. And this is what happens to David. He, he prays in this prayer, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And so he's, he's longing to be pure. He didn't have that longing when he called for Bathsheba. He says, do not cast me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He wants to be with God. 
He doesn't want to run from God anymore. He doesn't want to hide from God anymore. He wants to be connected with God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And he knows that ultimately when he's in a right relationship with God, there is joy in the presence of God. He can sing and celebrate because he knows he's forgiven. Do you see how Psalms of Confession, the acknowledgement of sin invites the blessing of God in our life? Do you see how David spells that out? Do you see how he lives that out? And do you see how God invites all of us to join in? How God invites all of us on a daily basis. And this morning I'm focusing on forgiveness and confession with God. Not necessarily with one another. We can apply these same steps in human relationships with friends and family. But I'm most focused on God this morning. And where are you at? Because there's two different groups of people that are here this morning. Those who haven't asked for forgiveness yet. And I'm not talking about you know, going to somebody and asking forgiveness. I'm talking about you being alone with God and acknowledging that you've sinned against him, that you have not lived the way he's called us to live, and that's all of us. And that we're all in this boat together. And the this, this step you need to take this morning is the step to confess your sin to him. Now is the time. You've been listening and learning about Jesus, maybe connecting with some people here at United Church, and, and now's the time for you to take that step into a relationship with God and to be right with him. Maybe you've taken that step and um, you've been forgiven. And the thought that I want to leave with you is live in light of that. Live in light of the forgiveness that the guilt of sin has been removed from you. There's no more shame that you have to live in. There's no more fear of judgment that you have to experience. Live in the joy. Sing, rejoice, celebrate. Forgive other people the same way you've been forgiven. Share this news with other people. And as we close, we're going to reflect together on what we just read through about confession in the Bible. Uh, And I want to encourage you in a couple ways. Maybe you've never confessed before. Is now the moment for you to do that right here in the seat on this morning and to confess to God and step into a right relationship with him. Maybe you're stuck in a pattern of sin and just making bad choices after bad choices after bad choice and you need to say, like, God, help me get out of this bad pattern. I'm stuck. Just help me get out of this. I don't know what to do. Cry out to God. Ask him to help you. And even though you don't need to talk to somebody else to be forgiven of your sin from God, the Bible does teach that when we confess our sins to other people, maybe a trusted friend or a family member, that we experience healing of sin in that way too. And there's really a power when we talk to somebody else about the sin that we're trying to deal with and work through. And although you don't need to do that to become a Christian and step into a relationship with God, it really fast forwards your relationship with God when you do it. And maybe the step you need to take this morning is to bring somebody else into that private world that you have and to lay it all out there and say, I don't want to stay here anymore. Now I'm just going to give you some time to interact with God and to reflect, what do I need to do as a result of this? Maybe you need to be encouraged. Keep it up. You know, when you do wrong, when you screw up, when you make a mistake, have that disease, whatever word you want to use, but it's sin, you confess to God. Just keep it up because you continue to invite the blessing of God into your life through that practice. And we're going to then take communion together. Not sure they're just going to go ahead and they're going to pass these communion trays. And if you're comfortable taking communion, why don't you just go ahead and take that in your own time to remind yourself, hey, all that stuff, all that junk, all that sin has been paid for and removed by Jesus. That reminds us every week that we can be connected to God through him and then thank him for what he's done.